Rise of the TMNT one of the greatest cartoons to come from Western animation in the past decade, and a show that I utterly failed. If there was a moment to use my platform to support a show, this was the moment, and I let it down. When I first saw the announcement for this generation of the TMNT, I was absolutely turned off, based on the character designs alone. Why is Raph so big? What's with Donnie's stupid forehead? Yeah. Master Splinter? He looks super lame. And I was not alone in my dissatisfaction, as many other fans of the TMNT franchise hated what was in front of them. Regardless, I stubbornly held my disposition and basically ignored the show for years until my friend and fellow YouTuber, Jaxblade, finally got me to crack. According to him, I was missing out on one of the best animated things ever made. And in 2022, I came around and realized what I had been missing out on. Oh, yeah! I say the following to no hyperbole. Rise of the TMNT just might be one of the best cartoons ever made. Period. And the poor show was unofficially cancelled before I realized what was before me. I was getting hyped while watching season 1 and even got Rise merch. By the way, thanks Emily, go hit up her Etsy shop if y'all want cool Rise stickers and keychains, by the way. But then reality hit me like a wrecking ball, as I sat pouting in my living room after finishing the TV movie, needing more. I realized then and there, that if I could not be there for Rise of the TMNT during its airing, I at least owed it some love and support in hindsight. To figure out exactly why this show was so great, how a cartoon of such high caliber like this can even exist, and finally, that maybe it might come back someday. Again, it is unofficially canceled, meaning that this fight is not 100% over. For this video, I was lucky enough to get the opportunity to talk to some of the writers and artists for Rise of the TMNT and get an insider look about how the show came to be. Because trust me folks, when you behold this show for all it's worth, it is a miracle that something of this quality could even exist. But before we get into the video, I want to give a quick shout out to this video sponsor, Control. Now, for those who don't know, Control is a brand owned and operated by gamers and esport legends who decided to make healthier food options for people like us. Some of said legends who use Control include Rick Ross, Optic Scump, FaZe Clan, Luminous. <laughs> I'm such a boomer. Luminosity Gaming. There was a misinput, misinput. Calm down! You calm the f down! There was a misinput! If you're looking to eat healthier meals or even lose weight, Control's meal replacement shakes are the best option. Hell, I recently moved into a new place and I had like no food in my kitchen for like a week because I'm sad. But I had a control delivery that arrived right before I moved in. No joke, it came to the rescue quite a few times for me. I was able to get some high protein snacks too with their protein cookies and meal bars. So if you want to get back on track with nutrition and make a healthier change, go hit up drinkcontrol.com slash saberspark and use code SABERSPARK to get 10% off your first order. Or, if you want to save some money on shipping and get these amazing products quicker, you can go into your local GNC and pick some up. Control also offers a bundle builder, which allows new customers to try selections at a discounted price that ranges as much as 20% off. Find out more at Control's homepage and click their banner for additional info. On that note, back to the video. Come back! If you ever want to milk the puppies, they have eight nipples! No, stop, no! So, I grew up during the 1990s, and I was no stranger to the TMNT. I watched the cartoon, I had the toys. I was the dream demographic for multi-billion dollar corporations who were slinging turtle toys like no tomorrow. But eventually, I started to simmer down with my TMNT passion, and never really reached those peaks again for the rest of my life. Until recently. Yes, I know, TMNT got the My Little Pony generational treatment, and it comes in waves every so often. And if you want a deep dive video discussing said generations, then I highly recommend the video from Jack's Blade. Link is in the description. But I guess I was one of those old goats who saw the original generation as THE generation, and that nothing to come afterwards could compare. Guess what? I was wrong. Very wrong. Boo this man! No! 
As far as TMNT fans go, there were quite a few who considered themselves open to Rise the TMNT, though understandably skeptical. The changes that were being advertised were way bigger than anything most fans had seen before, and both old and new fans alike were concerned to see something they held so iconic pull a potential 180. As is the case with most reboots, a good chunk of the internet wrote off Rise of the TMNT before an episode had even aired. Inevitably, Nickelodeon noted the reaction and released five episodes online before the show's official release. The network did not need to do this, but it's an obvious attempt to convince fans to give it a fair shot. Again, the character designs alone were jarring to many fans, with Rise taking a massive departure from what people initially think of when it comes to the TMNT. Also, many viewers thought the tone of the show was too drastically different and overly comedic. Some even went as far to claim that the franchise was trying to take a similar route to Teen Titans Go, but that could not be further from the truth. However, some people stated that this dramatic shift just might be what the Turtles needed to strike lightning in a bottle in a bold new direction. There is a CBR article from the Nickelodeon Group president who said, quote, The Turtles is a property that has reinvention in its DNA, which keeps it fresh and relevant to every new generation while satisfying the demand from its adult fans. Turtles has been an incredibly important franchise for us since we reignited it five years ago, and we're excited for the new series to take the characters in a different direction with more humor, a younger and lighter feel, and all new dimensions to explore." End quote. The article also said, quote, "...much like Teen Titans experienced a shift in fan resistance when it morphed into Teen Titans Go, the same can be expected here. It's new ground, and it might feel slightly unfamiliar at first, but once you get sucked in, it's a new type of turtle power. It's not easy to let go of the nostalgia and feelings associated with fond childhood memories. Yet Rise of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles could be for a new generation where the 80s series was for many of us." End quote. Rise is called Rise for a reason. It's about these characters growing and becoming the team that we all kind of casually expect them to be in pop culture. It's a younger, more green version of the Turtles, and the story quickly shows that the humor is paired with moments of heart and vulnerability. Each character has issues they personally struggle with and arcs they're going on throughout the series. Splinter initially comes across as a complete buffoon, a bastardization of the wise sage he tends to be in nearly every other incarnation. But his past is much different than we've seen before, and there's a lot more to him than initially is obvious. Leo does not take any of the threats they face all that seriously. Raph is actually the leader in the show. Being the oldest, he tries his best to be responsible and take care of his brothers, even though the burden of doing so is constantly tearing him apart. Donnie is more of a tech nerd than ever before, even rejecting the mystic weapons everyone else gets in episode 1 to stay with his tech. They even give him a misformed soft shell, a reason to explain without saying a word why he became so enamored with science and tech in the first place. Rise is definitely more comedic than other recent versions of these characters, but it has a lot of heart. And if you can get on board with the fact that it's fun first, then there's still a lot of great character moments that make you fall in love with these versions of the Turtles in a way that no other entry really does. Obviously, the whole goal of the series was to grow those characters over the course of the entire series, as you see. And to do that, they had to start out in a very different place from where they usually start out. But some people just didn't want to give that a chance. The backlash was expected, but the writers of the show believed that the changes would be worth it. And this was actually not the first time that a change stirred up controversy in the Turtle fandom. Well, one thing is... Having been on the 2012 show, we knew that they always push back on anything that's new and different. In that series, right. we got huge flack about Donnie having a gap in his teeth and how many toes the turtles had <laughs> just when the initial designs were released. So I think from a design standpoint, we always knew that the designs would shock people. It was a bold yet risky decision from the rise of the TMNT show staff, but at the end, it would pay off and truly make its mark. It's time we grew up and accepted our destiny as descendants of the Tomato Clan. It's Hamato. That's it. It is Hamato, right? When it comes to the rise of the TMNT, one of its most outstanding traits is undeniably its animation. In the current world of Western animation, it is virtually peerless. The consistency of the art direction and animation in this show is far beyond pretty much every American Western cartoon released in the last decade. 
Ever since the early 2010s with Adventure Time, mainstream American cartoons moved away from complex character designs in favor of streamlined, simplified, rounded characters that were easier to animate. This allowed for smoother animation at the expense of overall fidelity. Combined with other shows using puppet animation, which also benefits from simpler designs, this became the standard very rapidly. But for Rise, it goes in the complete opposite direction. While lots of contemporary shows make references to anime, you know, since showrunners at this point grew up with the medium, Rise took it a step further and said, what if we actually made an anime? From the highly detailed character designs, with thick, bold outlines, to the sharp, complex shape language, to actual cell shading that seems to have been drawn by hand instead of using puppets. Rise elevates itself to an entirely new level of visual expertise that we have not seen on network TV basically ever before. Rise seems to pull its primary visual inspiration not just from anime, but a specific animation studio, Trigger, and arguably also from Gynex, which is where most of Trigger's original staff came from. Uh, shit, bro. <laughs> like, uh, that was my fault. Sorry. <laughs> no, I was no. the first board artist <laughs> that came on the show. And so I was like, yeah, I was the first one. And so they gave me the episode because like, I took a test and they're like, holy shit. First drawing, first boards was me. And then I was just like, yeah. Let's, let's show up. And so it definitely all started in boards. I will say this. You mentioned Trigger. Like, that was a big inspiration for, for sure. Oh, yeah. Anime like, is really good at, like, going super hardcore. But then, you know, like, they have the cheap stuff to pay for it. The thing is, American execs don't understand the cheap stuff. So we just had to make it normal, which is more work, right? So I, I'm, I don't take blame for that. I don't take blame for the talking heads when they're all like doing all their their flips and shit. I will take blame for all the action stuff. And then like Flying Bark had a lot of like efficiency notes. So they were more conscious of like what it took. Tom, who's like the supervising animator, like head honcho over there, was like basically me in Australia. So like we bonded over just like one upping everything we've ever seen before. So and there was I mean, a lot of that too, like a lot of one upping by the board team. So it's like, if someone did something cool, the next person that comes in be like, oh, shit, I gotta show up. There was a push for puppet animation from like execs who wanted to save money. On the movie, they had a problem because the studio that they got to do the movie initially wasn't Flying Bark. It was someone else. And like, they were contracted for puppet animation and it just wouldn't work. It had to be hand-drawn, like it had to. It's one of those things, like I can mostly comment on my boards. It's one of those things where it's like, it's not really, like, don't think of it like 50-50, like it, there's like an allocation. I did the max that you could possibly do in boards for the action set pieces. And then Flying Bark took that and did the maximum amount they could possibly do to push it. Like, yeah, I it was... literally did it to like the f***ing computer crash. Like, I did it <laughs> until the application broke, right? Hell yeah. And then Flying Bark, you would get the footage back and it's like, it's 10x, right? Like, <laughs> so it's two people going at 100% for those epic fights. That's kind of how it ended. There's no official more, more time. There's no overtime pay, nothing. So like the more time you got was like, you looked at the animatic editor and you're like, hey, I'm gonna send this like next week. And it's like, okay, I'll do everything else but that. So you get more time, but it's not like additional pay. Like you're just kind of extending like the schedule in between. For it feels like too, it was a passion project. And, uh, like the, yeah, for, for a, a lot, lot of people of it. it ended up, yeah. With a lot of shows either being 3D or puppeted, like a lot of hand-drawn stuff that's on model, that's not just like loopy stuff is like kind of getting less and less. And like the spectacle of 2D is getting less and less. So, I mean, it was a cool show to flex on. If you could like put your money and get like double the return, like you're gonna just throw as much money you yeah. can, right? And right. that's what it was like with Flying Bark. Like you, whatever you put in, they doubled it. And it's just like, holy shit, I'm gonna put in a lot, mother Lots of Trigger's visual motifs are on display throughout Rise, putting lots of emphasis on extremely bold key poses to give their animation a hyper-real sense of weight during fight scenes, with punctuations of a single panning shot of a character in an imposing pose to really sell the intensity of a single moment. Middle-tier animated segments using two to three strong repeated keyframes to imply way more diamondism than is actually being drawn 
to having gag bits use simple deformed single frames that just tween along the screen with no real animation at all to give the joke a completely different visual presence and contrast to the rest of the episode. According to a video uploaded to Nickelodeon's website featuring animators from Rise, quote, from start to finish, it takes about 60 weeks to make an episode of Rise of the Team and T. It's a digital hand-drawn show. They use their tools essentially like a digital piece of paper. They animate frame by frame. They're using the tools in a very traditional sense. The animation on display here is just constantly overachieving. Multiple times per episode, the animators will go out of their way to give themselves extra work in the name of presentation and just plain showing off. While even the most technically competent anime will still fill a lot of its runtime with panning shots and static characters just with lip movement, Rise is always moving. Leonardo does not just walk down a staircase. He'll flip and jump and roll around with dynamic perspective. Conversations will often have characters doing something while talking, like the turtles skateboarding in their lair, or have Mikey doing background gags while Raph and Leo are talking seriously. Nearly every episode has a fight scene packed to the brim with extreme foreshortening, dynamic camera angles, and tons of impact frames for extra weight. Even the intro has so many dynamic shots, it's almost overwhelming to the senses, as everyone and everything moves more than any other cartoon has dared to attempt in years. In an exclusive interview with Team T writers Russ Carney and Ron Corsello, the praises of the board artists and animators are sung highly by the writing teams of the show. We have one board artist, Kevin Molina Ortiz, who is also one of the uh, it's a story on the on the movie, who sort of set the bar high for everybody else because he would turn in these like four thousand frame storyboards where he just super animated everything, and then everybody else kind of had to like stay in all night and keep up with that. He just set the standard incredibly high, wow. and I mean it's all in the boards too. All of all those poses that you see, it's hard for me to go back and watch cartoons like from the eighties where you see two people having conversation and one person's face is not changing or not moving <laughs> at all for the entire conversation even i mean on this show characters are reacting as another character is talking it's like what you would see in a live action show where the right. actors act all the time the characters act all the time and it is a lot of work you know i get frustrated you know when i when i see people obvious you know ignorant people complain oh the animation i don't think this animation is horrible uh, because like i read those comments some, I, my perspective is you have no idea what animation is or what goes into it because to, to call this horrible it's like what every it's fluid movement there's it's not like you know jumpy uh i've seen a lot of cartoons where you know movement is jumpy and it's not fluid and you know you, you yeah people are standing people you know one character moves and another character moves it's yeah it, it's just frustrating to read that kind of so stuff. the animators certainly pulled their weight but again, what makes everything about Rise of the TMNT such a marvel is the fact that there was so much collaboration, and every piece was so seamlessly working together from the outside looking in. One incredible combination, though, was between the writers and the storyboard artist. It was a deliberate choice by our showrunners, Ant Ward and Andy Soriano, to pair up comedy writers with action board artists. The one side effect was that our scripts had to get shorter in order to, to accommodate a lot of that action. Like a normal comedy script, what, Ron, like 12 to 13 pages or something yeah, actually, uh, for 11 minutes? 14. Yeah, but we had to keep them to 12 or less, basically. Yeah, I mean, like, you know, 10 and a half was sort of our, our target, I think most of the time because you know there had to be ample room for the board artists to you know to kick ass with the animation it was always a battle about what's going to get cut the jokes or the action all things considered both the writing and the boarding for rise met a perfect middle ground and absolutely complemented one another there was no questioning the combined talent of the team and how all of their creativity coalesced together speaking of talent we had the chance to speak to laura another storyboard artist from the show who shared with us of how she went from being a fan of Rise to working on it. So I posted them online and JJ thought he was from the show, but he could not recall on which episode because I did them. I, that's, I did fan storyboards, so that's how they got me like into the movie. And that's, 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 that's how I started on the on Rise. I got into Rise when it was left out by everybody. I just, I was on like a fan Discord. And we were like 30. It was nothing. 
the 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 fan content was dead mm -hmm. but i was so hyped on it i just i drew stuff and i <laughs> knew it was something very special but nobody watched it it was slept on i was so mad i did everything good to get my friends to watch it no one did no one did i got the first email from jj i cried the whole day oh. i did <laughs> like Good tears, bad I, tears, I, yes, good, a little good, both. I could not <laughs> believe what was happening to me. They asked for like more stuff and I didn't have anything. So I kind of rushed in three days to do something. It was my first first action board ever. And I sent it to you. I was so sleep deprived. I haven't slept in like three days. I sent it to them. They were like, okay, she's good. We can take her. I stayed on the production for like nine months. The amount and the quality of work that was asked was the highest I've ever worked on. Since I was a huge fan, I really wanted to show up. And that was my whole day. I also never watched anime. So I had to get on board really, really quick. I had to learn fast. <laughs> I watched one again, I watched Kill Like Kill. I watched all of the trigger stuff because that's what, the, that's what they were asking for me to do. I was like, okay, I'm gonna do this stuff. Now, if Rise's beauty was only skin deep though, it would be an impressive technical showcase, but not a great show. However, Rise is a great show, and that really comes down to its biggest strength, the cast of characters, and how they interplay with one another. Rise has a bit of a connected storyline going on with the Foot Clan and recovering the dark armor, but it isn't until the series finale that episodes actually connect directly after the other. The entire rest of the series are firmly episodic in nature, and this allows the cast to take center stage, as they're placed week after week into increasingly ridiculous scenarios that let us explore who these characters are and how they play off each other. This was a brilliant move, because it lets the best part of the show stand in the spotlight. The Turtles and Rise actually feel like brothers constantly riffing on each other, poking fun at one another, always trying to have the last word when they butt heads, but at the same time, always very sincere in their love for one another. This is probably the aspect of the show that most surprised me. Despite being primarily a comedy first, Rise is not afraid to let us see how vulnerable all the cast is. They all feel, ironically enough, very human. This is arguably a cartoon primarily aimed at young boys, or at least that's probably what the Nick executives were aiming for. But you have episodes where the Turtles are sincerely running an errand for Splinter because they all want a hug from him. They say that they love each other often too. The show is very much about familial bonds, and it doesn't shy away from displaying that fact in a very authentic manner. It was interesting how like these small things can cause so much issue among like the most hardcore fans but like you know these properties are so sacred to a lot of people and it means a lot but like at the same time it's like do you want the same thing over and over again like that was like what i found so refreshing about watching the show was just that it felt like different but it, in a good way it, it, it felt like it was pulling from a different pool of influences instead of just reiterating and like uh, on what came before it with you know like the, a lot of the uh the yokai stuff and the magic weapons and a lot of like i'm assuming <laughs> A ton of anime influence like specifically it feels like you guys just like the animation team is like sitting down looking at like studio triggers work you know something like you're in login or or kill a kill like we're just gonna make that we're just gonna do that but with green characters and they totally nailed it from the writing perspective the push for us was essentially to do everything differently there were no rules they basically just wanted the core thing was magic I'm not exactly sure what prompted that but i was sort of a you know the turtles have magic okay fine everything else was you know just do everything differently differently than, you know, it had been done in the past. So, I mean, you know, that's why part of why, not the only reason why, but part of why Leo's a leader, you know, it, it gives him an entirely different character and an arc to grow. You know, he, he begins as a corner cutting goofball and, you know, eventually takes on, understands this, the, the gravity of what they're dealing with. We, as a collective writing group, got to make a lot of decisions about what we wanted to depict in the series. We didn't, you know, there were no mandates from above about, like, 
you know, family or anything like that. We wanted to make sure that we really wanted to, you know, highlight good side of brotherhood and, you know, also kind of, you know, maybe make a little contribution in buffing off the edges of toxic masculinity and things yes. like that. That's why we do a lot of hugging. You know, this is what you're supposed to do as a human being. You know, those are all things that, we, you know, we came up with. There were no no mandates about that kind of stuff. And it shows in that our, the show does appeal to girls and, and young women. A lot of our fan base is female. A lot of our fan base is LGBTQ or non-binary and things like that. Everybody appreciates that family bond. And we really find that that's what gets people into a show is family bonding. And they see that it, it really draws them into it. I think Andy deserves a lot of credit for that too, Russ. He really pushed a lot of the family bonding stuff throughout the show. We did actually get a writing boss in season two. We should give Tony yeah, a little yeah. credit. <laughs> Tony Lobo was our story editor who came in right towards the end of season one and he also you know co-wrote the movie and was also a great influence on the writing especially in the second season since we didn't have a whole lot of rules at the beginning we kind of wanted to see how far we could go with with the ridiculousness like you know hot soup being their catchphrase far far away from Kawabunga or even right. even Buya of the 2012 series and it was embraced yeah. Russ, you you do remember though how they tried to make us come up with another catchphrase, right? Like, they, oh <laughs> they yeah, we're not satisfied yeah. with that super close and wanted us to generate like lists of catchphrases, and we're like, you can't do that. Like, it's got to come organically out of the show. They wanted us to give them some, and remember, like Vindaloo was on the table, <laughs> right? <laughs> we weren't the only writers, you know. Ian Bush, another writer on the series, and. You know, Dale Malinowski and we're, we're all very pleased. You know, we're very happy to hear that. And we helped to create this this family. We're glad people liked it. And I think it's reflected in how tight the Rise of the TMNT fan family is. I mean, I, I don't think I've seen many fandoms that are so positive and so uplifting to each other and supportive. There are so many components that bring a production together. And while the technical side of things is important, one thing that absolutely makes this show one of the most iconic representations of these turtles is the stellar voice acting cast. You would think that just nailing the turtles would be enough, but this show cut no corners and made every role just as iconic as the last. To start, Eric Bauza not only crushed that splinter, but if you pay attention, you can hear him as several other incidental characters sprinkled in throughout the show. This cartoon was basically a visual reel showing off the range of this man, and it was a fun guessing game of find the Bauza whenever a new silly character was on screen. Also, John Cena came in and killed it as Draxum. I didn't even know that was John Cena at first. I guess I couldn't see him. However, if you pay close attention, you will also hear Roger Craig Smith also voice Draxum at certain points in the show. It's subtle, but it's neat that both actors got to jump in. And if we want to talk about cameos, Zelda Williams is an absolutely amazing addition to the cast playing the foot recruit Cassandra Jones. Her comedic timing is incredible, and she does an amazing job at bringing the silliness of the character to life. But obviously, what brings this show together is the incredible main cast of Turtles. Omar Miller just completely captures that big bro vibe for Raph. Yes, 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 yes! In your face! And yours, and yours, and yours again! What? You didn't even want the job! It was before I won! Brandon Smith plays a perfect goofball, just pulling Mikey off the page. I'm Dr. Feelings. Welcome to my seminar. Hug it out. Dr. Feelings? I thought you were Dr. Delicate Touch. Dr. Delicate Touch feels nothing. And Josh Brenner captures the charm and absolute dorkitude that is Donatello. Oh, hey guys, what's the haps? Huh? Oh, oh, this? I didn't realize I had it on. This is my sweet new purple satin jacket. Yep. Got it for being a bit of a tech whiz. That's nice. Purple dragons, members only, no big deal. Mm -hmm. Also, you got Kat Graham as April O'Neil, and she does a wonderful job especially when she sings. I've got non-weirdo friends, like like my new friend Sunaira, Su Sunira, Sunita, who I'm texting to see if she wants to hang out later. And she does, ha, in your face! And when you put them all together, they make one uniquely delicious turtle soup ensemble. A real symbiotic relationship between the writers and the voice actors, at least on a good show it is, because we were lucky at Rise of the TMNT because we didn't have a boss. Normally there's a head writer, a story editor, but our story editor was let go like a week after we got there. So we basically, all the various writers assumed that role. So we were in every record. And so we interacted with the actors a lot. 
and the characters that you see on the screen are based heavily on the actual actors. Like much of their characteristics is drawn from the actual personalities of the actors. And you definitely learn how to write to the voice of each actor, especially when you sit there with them every week and how to, you know, just write lines that you know they're going to deliver just great. And when you hear them deliver it just the way you imagined it in your head, it is such a satisfying feeling. So That's it's a real two-way street. When we were trying to figure out the voices of the characters, you know, we, we were trying to think of, as you would, existing shows, Troy and Abed from Community, for example, being somewhat analogous to Mikey and Donnie, respectively. Oh my God, I didn't even make that connection, but I absolutely see it. <laughs> but also, you know, in terms of dynamic, one of the ideas that came up was kind of it's always sunny in Philadelphia dynamic. And so Frank and Splinter are somewhat parallel <laughs> in, in that regard. <laughs> you know, he's, he's a you know, Frank. Danny DeVito, look at him. <laughs> yeah, you know. I love that. You know, purple one, get over here. A hey, blonde. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But unlike Frank Reynolds, Splinter is not a total piece of crap forever. Right. <laughs> you know, he does he does grow out of it. Look at from the logical standpoint of this poor guy got turned into a rat. This guy was a major movie star who got turned into a rat. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, how would he feel about that? He, he'd be down in the dumps for a while. Who wouldn't? That was supposed to be the point. But then when, you know, when duty calls, he does rise to the occasion. We usually get radio plays just to get the mood of the line. So we, we do story boards, we don't do lip sync. Uh, so we just get the mood of what, what he's saying because reading something is not the same as hearing it. Yeah, for the animators, they'll get the recording. So yeah, we record in pre-production. Like we Sometimes don't... we do scratch. Yeah, you could put scratch. Sometimes the scratch, like they can't get a voice actor in. So the scratch makes it to Australia and they just have to like board it. And then they'll do retakes on the back end. The normal schedule, like if everything worked, recordings first before they start. Animating. And in many cases, like especially if you have like a good cast, I'd be in there in the booth. And like they, you know, the writers would write a line like Donnie's supposed to say this. And then like the voice actor is just like he's such a good improv that he'll make just these random rants. Yes. No, like all of them. Like I'm talking like every single, they would just start talking to each other in the booth. And so you'd have like these long, weird lines that are like fucking hilarious. <laughs> and then, yeah. So I, I think like the, the note of like everyone coming in and putting in their best. But yeah, in terms of like sequencing and Western for sure, it's like EMR comes first or record. It, comes it first. felt like that would be the case because so, so much of the dialogue in the show felt very natural. And I was wondering if like, some of it was improv because like when we talked so to- So um, much, yeah. We talked to the writers so and they were saying that like uh, they spent I a mean. lot of time <laughs> getting to know all the, like, the voice actors and stuff. So a lot of the, the dialogue ended up being like written with them in mind as opposed to just yeah. writing the character itself. They kind of like blended yeah. together. So it just feels like everywhere, like just passion is really the rule of the day when it came to like making this as special as it was. Leo, because he's so, he's so extra. You cannot go wrong with Leo. He's so funny and extra. And Donnie, to some extent? I think it would be Donnie for me because no cap Donnie because of like the improv the voice actor did. We would get extra EMR clips of just like, ah, you could use this if you want. And like, I oh, like, it was just like phenomenal. Like he would just have random rants in the middle of like the EMR talking about random shit, And it's just like the funniest thing ever. It would be cut down for time, but like that's what made boarding him so fun. I would always listen to him first. Like he was my favorite. Well, I can go on and on praising the show. There were, however, things that, after taking a closer look, could have been improved. Most of the issues I found, to be fair though, did not really have much to do with the skill of the people working on it or the overall end result, but more so dealt with the constraints and the environment they were working in within the industry as a whole. First and foremost, the runtime issues with the show created a difficult situation across the board, limiting what they were able to do and the story. In a fantasy world where I can wave a wand and make alterations to big budget shows, I would have advocated for these artists to be given a few more episodes to really develop some things that were kind of rushed in the end of the second season mostly centered around Leonardo. The very last sentence of this series is Splinter declaring Leo as the new leader of the team, something that comes out of left field and doesn't feel all that earned. It's kind of played off as a joke, since the end of the series otherwise has the Turtles, where we mostly expect them to be in other incarnations of the series, with them all having their signature weapons and being far more competent fighters. If given more time, I think there was a plan to develop Leonardo to rise to the role of leader of the team instead of thrusting it at him. Leo is very much a laid-back, nonchalant, devil-may-care character throughout the majority of the show. 
but there's an entire episode near the end of the series where it's shown that he actually is incredibly good at reading people and situations and having a seemingly unhinged plan fall into place exactly as he predicted, in a way that Raph never really does. Raph is a reactive leader, spurred to leadership out of a sense of responsibility, being, you know, being the elder brother. But they show here, in this episode, that Leo has a potential to be a proactive leader, able to assess the situation the team finds themselves in, and leverage his ally's strengths and his enemy's vulnerabilities to his advantage. It's a bit of a shame that there wasn't more runtime dedicated to this, because it seems like it could have been building to a leo Raf rivalry that a lot of the other interpretations of the series has. But with a lot more heart, Raph would not have been an aggressive, bullheaded bruiser trying to challenge Leo's authority. It could have been Leo trying to ease a burden Raph feels he has to carry, being the eldest brother. And abandoning that position would have constituted personal failure. Now, this aspect of Leo is explored more in the movie. But without the interactions with his brothers, since that growth happens largely while he's separated from everyone else, and Raph is under the control of the Krangs, well, we don't really get any real friction between them. As far as Leo exploring his leadership skills, this is also more explored in the movie. But you can absolutely tell that they're trying to cram in a lot into the film that did not allow for as much development as the staff or viewers would have liked. Which, you know, is a bummer. But despite all that, it still kicked ass. Time constraints are really a product of the entertainment industry as a whole, as I mentioned before. And another harsh reality set in motion by these constraints is that pressure the creatives feel to cram all the story into a shorter, simpler time span, fighting over what gets cut down to the wire. According to a Screen Rant article by Kristen Brown, when Rise of the TMNT premiered, it was meant to last for three seasons. However, low toy sales paired with poor marketing caused Nickelodeon to cancel season three and cut season two in half. To formally end the series, Rise of the TMNT, the movie, moved from television to streaming on Netflix. While the show was never officially canceled, only paused, this still inevitably affected the overall product and flow of the show. With the fear of being canceled at any moment always looming over your head, alongside the streaming war debacle that could lead to your entire show being put in limbo for who knows how long, while the money suits decide who's allowed to profit off your work. It can create a soul-crushing environment to work in that bottlenecks into all levels of production. But this show was somehow able to overcome a lot of this, with some members of the team even mentioning in an interview that what made this show so special was the environment they were able to cultivate with their fellow staff. That is a huge part of what made this show such an outlier. I think the ambition of the artists on there and then being in an environment where like everyone wants to be the best version of whatever craft they're doing helped a lot. I would have conversations with other directors in the industry, like looking in on the turtle crew, not like what we were able to produce, but the turtle crew themselves. And it was like an enigma. It was a very, very unique con concoction like a very unique culture at the Turtle Crew that everyone got better every episode because they were all like this like super positive but still competing with each other and they would constantly hype more and more. And I assume the same thing happened at Flying Bark in Australia. It was really something special. Do you want to go back to that feeling of like a good team doing something so good? That above all was probably like the best thing about the production. Everyone got better. The environment was just so great. Like you could just walk in and like look what other people were doing. Just, just the, that feeling made the show that good. When you want to show up. Like you don't want to be like, oh, I want to like make that guy look bad and like be better than that person. But it's like that person did something so amazing. I want to do something that's that amazing, right? There was like the camaraderie still. Like it was such a healthy work environment. It just goes to show how truly incredible every artist, every writer, every participant involved in Rise of the Team and T truly were. They pulled together their talent and drive to create an outstanding cartoon that went way above expectations. Why? One word, passion. And boy, does it show on every single level of the show. In conclusion, Rise of the Team and T stands as one of the greatest cartoons in recent history. And all of this was accomplished by a passionate team that fed off of each other's talent and drive. They could have easily phoned in the results on every aspect of the production, but the complete opposite happened. The writing, the animation, the voice acting, 
Just every aspect of this series fired on all cylinders, resulting in a series that blew away expectations when given the chance. Once more, my timing for this show was poor, and I truly wish I could have actively supported Rise during its airing. As it stands, the series is not 100% dead and has the blueprints to continue if the overlords at Paramount make it so. Now, it's a doubtful situation, but not entirely hopeless. And hey, if anything, it's been nice to see a more bold approach to TMNT these past few years. First, we had Rise of the TMNT, and recently, we had Mutant Mayhem on the big screen, which was a great movie. Both versions of the Turtles feel more bold with their visuals and their writing, which is a win no matter what. For those who want to try and keep the flame alive for Rise, though, just continue to support the show and those who worked on it. Crazier things have happened, and maybe someday we will see the Mad Dogs return to officially finish what they started. Well, certainly promoting this show would be great. I think more people who watch it and see it and the cult following expands, not really a cult following. I mean, that's bragging rights for us. So, I mean, even that is is helpful because, you know, to be able to say, hey, you know, we all worked on this series that, you know, there's a lot of people out there who really liked it. That feels good. We could show future employers the litany of people who love it. We, we had sort of a screening of the final episode for the crew via Zoom because that was during COVID. But at the end, we were all just talking to each other. And he said something like, history is going to smile on this series. You know, it's going to be remembered a lot better.